Good morning, everyone, and very welcome to this roundtable about childhood and governmentality. Uh, my name is Tom Axelsson, and I'm from Malmö University in Sweden, and I will share this roundtable. We have been organized by Patrick Ryan here. And in this roundtable, we have three scholars from diverse disciplines who will respond to the question, what does the concept of governmentality offer the historical and political analysis of childhood and youth? And each of them will provide around 10, 15 minutes uh, uh, and reflect upon this question in light of their own research interest. And after that, we hope we can drag everyone into the discussion after that. <laughs> so the first one to present is Sana Nakata from Political Science, University of Melbourne. And then we have Patrick Ryan from the Department of Interdisciplinary Program and History, King's University College at Western University. And finally, we have Mark Tisar from Faculty of Education of Social Work, University of Auckland. So welcome. Thank you for that introduction, Tom. Can you hear me? I'll move this up. Hello? Yeah, okay. I don't have somewhere to hook this, so I'm just going to um, hold on to it. Um, thank you very much, Tom, for the introduction. Um, thank you to the conference organisers for um, inviting us to um, present to you this morning as a plenary. I wish to begin by acknowledging that we meet on the country of the peoples of the Eora Nation. And I say this not as a formality or to legitimise my place on this country, but to acknowledge the many, many generations who have sustained their care for and ongoing political claim to the land that makes it possible for us to be here today. I thank their elders, past and present, for this intergenerational care for both country and kin that has ensured it is still possible to exist as a First Nations person in this country. My name is Sana Nakata. I'm a Torres Strait Islander whose university education and academic work has taken place at the University of Melbourne on NAM. I'm trained as a lawyer and a political theorist, and I'm going to offer my reflections today in two parts. My perspective on governmentality as a site of political analysis, and secondly, Volume. Okay. I'll try and move that there. Is that be much better? Okay. Um, and second, its usefulness for how we think about the idea of Indigenous childhood in Australia. I begin by offering my interpretation of governmentality, situating myself as a scholar who uses this word but is not strictly speaking part of the governmentality studies field. In particular, I wish to highlight that in terms of practice, I understand my work to be in the more general mode of problematizations of childhood in an effort to understand the formation of key social and political problems that demand our attention as adults, as scholars and as practitioners. Governmentality has been most useful in my work for its capacity to reveal relations between power and freedom in which one cannot reduce or empty the other out. That is, that the exercise of power does not in itself obliterate the potential for freedom and free conduct or the exercise of will, and that the existence and practice of freedom is never exercised in the complete absence of power. I follow Nicholas Rose in his claim that childhood is the most intensively governed sector of personal existence. I find this both uncontroversial and deeply instructive for how to engage in research about childhood, children and their everyday lives. I have argued in previous work that we govern children towards three key characteristics necessary to realise the conditions of future liberal adult citizenship. Reason, maturity and autonomy. We govern children in a range of ways. We measure them in the womb and assess their mother's well-being. We measure them moments after they exit the womb and place them carefully upon a series of charts. We count their hours of sleep, the intervals between, the ages when they walk and talk, 
and worry if they won't look in the eyes of strangers. We send them to care so that we can work and keep the roof over their heads to help make sure that another home won't be deemed more safe for them. And in Australia, from the age of three or four, we start getting reports on how their social and intellectual skills are developing. We tell them not to write on walls, to stay where we can see them, to sit still, to be quiet, to speak up, to say that this process of governing, the techniques, technologies, institutions, disciplinary power, ethics of care of the self and so forth is problematic is not the same as it is as saying that it is inherently bad or wrong, but rather that it is simply dangerous. I am not working here from a place of judgment. The difference between something being bad or wrong and something being dangerous is that the latter is a much more open concept. It's not a judgment, it's not an indictment, it's simply a possibility, it's a risk. Where badness or wrongness are declaratory judgments that imply injustice and necessarily call for amelioration, danger alerts us. It puts us on notice. I address this in my book in part through the work of Mitchell Dean, who wrote that security entails the regulation of certain individuals and groups in order to lead them to choose to exercise their liberty in a disciplined and responsible manner. My view on this is that the tension evident between power and freedom in these ways is not necessarily a critique of liberalism or of governing practices, but one of the defining features through which we make good liberal future citizens. This tension between power and freedom produces a form of governmentality around children that seeks to facilitate what I've developed more recently um, in an article both what I would describe as an openness to the new, to maximise the potential of each new life, to make predictable all the good that that newness might bring, and a closure to newness, to minimise the risk of each new life and its unpredictable bad. For me, governmentality draws our attention to the logics and practices that help reveal these acts of clo op openness and closure of the ways in which adults navigate and regulate the life who guides a lot of governmentality work in one of the rare moments in which he offers a reflection on children. Foucault was asked if he thought it repressive or somehow bad to discipline children so that, for example, they do not scribble on walls. His response was again, Colin Koopman writes in his account of this interview, unequivocal. There's no reason why this manner of guiding the behaviour of others should not ultimately have results that are positive, valuable, interesting, and so on. Foucault says, if I had a kid, I assure you he would not write on the walls. <laughs> or if he did, it would be against my will. The very idea. Koopman suggests that Foucault's aim was never to show that discipline and biopolitics were a bad thing. The point was to show that discipline, biopolitics and other stable features of our modernity are problematic in that they demand our serious attention. This captures my interest in governmentality and how I engage with it in my research. To make intelligible not the rightness or wrongness of this governmentality, but to offer what Koopman describes as infinite reflection of the dangers that governing practices produce, not just for the children who navigate this complexity daily in exceptionally diverse circumstances, but also to explore how this governmentality produces and reproduces through life the conditions of modern politics. And in Australia, the conditions of modern political life are the conditions of an ongoing colonial governance over Indigenous peoples and their affairs. So to my second part. Following Rose's claim of childhood as the most intensively governed time of, a pers of personal existence, it follows that the most effective form of managing any population is to intervene in family life, regulating the most private and intimate dimensions of human life. If one is seeking to manage a population in an effort to produce a more certain future, then it becomes essential to intervene in the lives of our youngest members. I want to make clear today that this is all the more acute for Indigenous children, 
whose existence every day operates as daily and generational reminders of the injustice and the founding illegitimacy of the Australian nation state. Indigenous Australian children open us to a future in which the Australian nation state can never be settled, in which its white imagination is proven impossible over and over again. The Indigenous Australian child, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in the historical record do not appear as neutral blank slates, but as a fundamental risk to the political legitimacy of Australia. Prehistoric, pre-modern, subhuman beings complicate the social contract of liberal states. Once human, the historical record begins to express modes of our infantilisation as children who could and would never grow up. This deeply complicates how we understand the danger of governing Indigenous children's lives, of how we understand practices that regulate openness to the new and closure to risk. During the period of assimilation, this meant regulating openness to becoming white and closure to the risk of racial recapitulation back to primitive blackness. In more recent times, this has become less coarse, but equity discourses slip quickly into assimilatory practices, and our well-being and development remains one that views us as less black the more educated we become. It remains that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children's lives and bodies are managed, responded to, saved and resolved in ways that must not undermine colonial power over the management of territory and population. But when we do sustain our care for our country and our kin over the course of generations, despite so many efforts to disrupt and interrupt that care, or put another way, when we insist on being free in the context of such acute governing power, our existence does just that. It challenges and transforms what we understand Australia can be. The political socialisation of Indigenous Australians positions us as a problem for the state to solve, as marginal, other, a loose thread or a frayed edge of the nation. Across periods of protectionism, assimilation and self-determination, Australia has grappled with this problem of Indigenous Australians in a range of ways, all of which have intervened in one way or another with relationships to country and relationships to kin. And since the arrival of the First Fleet, not too far from where we meet today, it has been done most effectively through the governing of our children, assessing our mothers, measuring us, counting us, surveilling us, stratifying us, finding better roofs to put over our angry black heads. I don't need to declare this bad or wrong to draw your attention to the danger these practices produce. Governmentality means that I don't have to argue about comparative health indicators or neglect notifications or educational outcomes. Governmentality allows me to direct the conversation elsewhere to a critical examination of how these practices do more than affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children's lives. These practices are not just the exercise of state power over our obliterated, powerless bodies. These practices are the formation of relations of power and freedom that we navigate daily. And through these relations, we become who we are. Strong, shattered, heartbroken, resilient, determined, enduring, exhausted, and proud. And through these relations that Indigenous children navigate every day, Australia has been made possible. Thank you. I think sometimes Foucault can become an obstacle, much like Marx or Freud. You say his name and it becomes a wall more than a bridge. And I think that's quite unfortunate. So I'm not going to begin by giving you my Foucault credentials. I'm not going to tell you that my papers are 
or an order. And I'm not going to ask all Foucauldians to stay the same. In fact, I'm going to talk about, start by talking about what his work has helped me do. And that's answer a question that I've been asking myself for more than two decades. And that is how to read a text historically. But he's not the only one that's helped me grapple with that unanswerable question. And I want to name some others. Stanley Fish, Raymond Williams, and more recently, an ancient historian, this may seem bizarre, but through interacting with Giorgio Agamben's work, a wonderful historian, Paula Friedrichsen, which I just discovered. All of them have things to say about reading texts. And I think if you are new to Foucault or haven't read very much Foucault or want to understand Foucault more, some of his difficult works maybe are not the place to start. I've slogged through, I, here are some credentials. I remember spending a year with the order of things in my back pocket. Probably made some kind of stamp on me, I don't know. But I would really suggest uh, Todd, Todd May's The Philosophy of Michel Foucault. Maybe some of you have read it. It's a great commentary on it, on his work. Or Gary Gutting's, Gutting's short uh, Oxford introduction to Foucault is also, I think, excellent. Um, I think there are two sociologists that some have been named already, maybe both of them, and you know them. And I think their work has really shaped my Foucault, right? And that is Nicholas Rose and Mitchell Dean. So there's this body of thought which is gr grown beyond the particular writer of the text that, um, that were produced in the 1960s and 70s and early 80s. And so my de definition of governmentality is up on the screen there, and it's influ influenced by the main questions I have. So I would say governmentality is a recursive discourse of modern rule. It is the conduct of conduct. And it is in that word discourse that it connects to a very specific way of trying to understand the text discourse relationship. I don't want to get bogged down in that, but that's the link for me. When you, I gave a paper yesterday on a recursive, what recursive texts are. Um, but I don't want to, uh, go in that direction. One thing that it allows us to do or tries to do as an analytic concept and a discourse of modern rule is to connect forms of rationality with practices of government. And, that, and, and therefore to connect the management of populations, which is the main uh, one way to understand what the modern state is about, to the production of subjects. And in a sense, Foucault is no, in no way alone in trying to make that connection. In fact, what he's doing with governmentality is perhaps fixing a problem that's there in Discipline and Punish. So he brings this word out in a 1978 set of lectures, and he's fixing something in Discipline. But he's trying to answer the, a question brought up in Marx, and that is, how do we relate consciousness to power, or knowledge of the self to power? And he wants to get out of the concept of false consciousness. And I think that's one way to understand what he's doing, and that's why it's interesting um, to me. But perhaps we need some for instances, and I want to give two kinds of for instances. One is here a laundry list of for instances where we might use this concept, and it's drawn on, on sort of present sort of policy or practices that involve childhood, and then the, the final example I'll get to is, will be historical. Um, I don't know if I can run through all of this, but there are two, there are two sides of, of uh, governmental rule. And one is uh, the uh, techniques of what Foucault calls the Christian pastorate, or the, the shepherd flock game. He calls them discipline in other places. They're, they're, they're actually inclusive. They're practices that produce subjectivity. So one example would be uh, any form of talk therapy where you talk about yourself, you produce yourself in those relationships. And there are specific conversational forms that come over, 
come out of counseling, um, where you make yourself an object of examination. I would say that addiction programs, so a fairly direct discursive thread connects something like Alcoholics Anonymous with Christian conversion narratives. You stay on the straight and narrow by maintaining a consistent cycle of self-examination and self-presentation. Hello, my name is Bill. I'm an alcoholic. A 1939 text. Um, only by rehearsing that you are a sinner slash alcoholic and powerless to self save yourself will you be saved. That's a production of a kind of subject position. And there's, perhaps it's dangerous, it's certainly not bad, it's helped many people. How does this fit back to the management of populations? If you can call yourself and inhabit a category, an alcoholic, then social programs, many of them, in law courts and in other places, in regulations, populations can be managed. You can't do the one without doing the other, and so much of government is about, about this. You know, one thing we, when we think about the pastorate or, or the conversion narratives or the, the counseling practices, we think, oh, it's the production of the self-examining subject. Kind of sounds sinister when you say that, right? Well, you know what it also is the production of? The ethical subject. The subject that can take themselves as an object in a relationship and get outside their own egotism so that they can see themselves as others. That's a trick. It's a foundational human capacity, but here's the thing. The techniques really matter. How it's done creates a certain kind of subjectivity, creates categories for people. I don't know if there's... Um, I think about educational... Uh, the other thing is the individual education plan. I don't know if there's a school system in the world not using forms of self-evaluation and learning. So it might be every child has an IEP in Sweden, and it might be that you have to qualify to have an IEP in Canada. You have to have a diagnosis. But the core of the IEP is you write a self-evaluation of your own learning process. I don't know what's happening in your university classrooms, but there's something I've noticed, and that is about 20% of my students have a diagnosis that I have to respond to somehow by part of an uh, evaluation process. This is not bad. I go along, I help them. But I have noticed over the last 25 years of teaching that today they seem to be more interested in the diagnosis of their own learning than the external content that we're trying to learn. That is, that is a recursive process of self-examination and it sorts people at institutions and changes simple things like how they take a test. I'm not going to go through all of these lists. I mean, does anyone doubt that family separation policies at the border not only sort population, but have an enormous impact on the subjectivity of the children? One can't happen without the other. That's the point. Who you think you are and what your subjectivity is is inseparable from the management of populations because governmental rule does not follow this pattern, thou shalt not. It follows the pattern of trying to understand the logic of the actors and creating a system by which they will make choices. You might not know this, but at family separation on the southern border, a huge, gripping, emotive story in the United States, I assume everybody in the room knows about this, the Obama administration absolutely did consider it. They decided for moral reasons not to do it. Those moral reasons didn't hold up in the Trump administration, obviously. But how does this work? It is supposed to be a lever to change the decision of the migrant. We all know it's a failed lever and a, and a brutal lever, but the governmental logic is they won't come if they know you will separate them. That is governmental logic. We could quite easily, and I'm sorry, I'm an American, and this is a statement of total brutality, but if the United States wanted to stop the caravan through brute sovereign force, they could do it. Of course, things would come apart at the seam if they did. But they didn't do that. They did something different. They did family separation at the border. 
trying to work on the rationality of the migrants themselves. It's disastrous, but that's not the point of understanding the governmental logic. I'm going to run out of time if I don't get along. One final thing. It sounds that's a sinister example. Who in the room hasn't heard a student say this? But I'm not a C student. You know, in other words, talking about themselves when you've given them a mark on their paper. You cannot disconnect that subject positioning from the process of sorting through transcripts. Which is extremely powerful in their lives, in their career trajectories, in their ability to get into university. The sorting of populations cannot work in the modern state without subject production. That's the point. That's Foucault's point. He's not the only one that makes it. This sensitizes to us to it. Now the historical example. How much time do I have, Tom? Oh my God. <laughs> The history of negligence. This is actually what I'm working on.、Um, the history of negligence. You know, liability law is something we can take for granted. Why? Because it governs, particularly if you're an American, <laughs> or actually anybody in a common law country. But the Americans have gone hog wild on this. That is the attempt to order a society through liability, rather than through administration. Now think about this. This didn't exist in the common law until the early 18th century. There are two principles. Of the law of negligence, as it used to be called, or liability law. One is proximate cause; the other is due care. Proximate cause is the foreseeable outcomes of an action if there's no intervening cause. That's what proximate cause means. Due care is that you are responsible for damages caused by things that are the proximate cause of your actions. So those two principles up,、uh, shape liability. Think about that. That governs behavior quite effectively through what the foreseeable, the rationality of the acting subject. It is not "thou shalt not." It is based on risk assessment. So, what's this have to do with childhood? I have to be really quick here.、Um, there are there are many many uses of liability law, but one of the most important ones was the regulation of work accident claims in the 19th century. And I'll have to move. Past the employer,、uh, the pl- employer defenses, but proximate cause and due care provide enormous exposure to industrial employers, depending on how they're interpreted. So the industrial employers come up with defenses, ways that they can say that a cause was not proximate, to use the legal language, but remote. But all of this p- depends upon the ability to shift the blame to the worker. That the worker should have assumed the risk, or that they did, or that they were contribute, they were a contributed negligent factor, an interceding factor, and so they're responsible. This is a way to lower their risk, so their exposure is less through legal vehicles. It's fairly effective until the early 20th century, but it falls apart earlier for children. Why? Because children by the hundreds in the United States go into courts. And they're able to display their own inability to take due care; that they are prima facie unable to take due care. Therefore, the employer defenses against their liability fall apart. They would work on adults, but not on 14, 15, or 16-year-old boys and girls. Now, there's always been a relationship between infancy and the ability to take due care. That's true, but the age goes way, way up into the category of teenagers that are a huge portion. Of the industrial workforce, and employers stop hiring them. So my big contention is this: child labor collapses in places like Canada and the United States before statutory regulation, and it's always been a mystery for historians. It collapses before the First World War. In the U.S., we don't have effective regulation until the Fair, Fair State Labor Standards Act of about 1938. Chris will correct me if I don't have it right, and. That's where we get really effective statutory enforcement, but the behavior totally changes beforehand. Why? Because the employers stop hiring the teenagers because the teenagers have used their competent agency to display their innocence, incompetence, to do care in the courts. <laughs>
their own self-reflective subjectivity allows the population to be resorted according to risk, and it changes child labor. And the effects of the collapse of child labor is the key lever for the entire creation of the governmental state. Schools, social work, it all. Without that, without the reorganization of working class households, the rest of it might not ever happen. Thank you. And thank you so much for um, having us here as a panel. It's a great privilege to be here, and uh, thank you to my uh, presenters um, who, were, who were presenting with me. It's a, it's a real um, experience to witness your scholarship and to be able to continue in the line of thinking with governmentality. And what I will do, I will try to outline a couple of thoughts on governmentality, and I will try to um, produce that governmentality through my um, understanding of relationship between the subject and an archive. I used to spend a lot of time in the archives researching childhoods. The opportunity to be part of this panel allows me to re-examine what, what it means to conduct discursive study in the material world and to re-examine the conceptual and philosophical framework I used when I spent months in Central European archives seeking genealogies of long-forgotten childhoods. Genealogists search for unexpected relationships and nonlinear accidental origins, whilst they focus on complexities and contradictive productions of childhoods through power knowledge relationships. Foucault reinterprets Nietzsche's concept of genealogy, and I use this notion to analyze the power structures which are the subject of my inquiry. Foucault's genealogy or genealogical method has a quote, unique interest in the power of practice, not subjects, to determine the form of discourse. Within this framework of genealogy, I used Foucault's notion of governmentality that Dune argues, quote, emphasizes a double focus on large political structures as well as on micropolitics to develop a sense of how political power produces subjects in society. And as such, genealogical studies produce a philosophical framework centered on the concept of governmentality in researching archival childhoods. Governmentality allowed me to research the alternative, nonlinear ways in which political rationalities govern childhood and child constructs, subjectivities. And it led me to examine how government agencies and system administer, said, administer children. Rose focuses on, quote, the forms of power that subject us, the systems of rule that administer us, the types of authority that master us. Whilst Lana and Walters explore governmentality from the position of, quote, how governing always involves particular representations, knowledges, and expertise. In my work, I extend these notions in terms of childhood, as governmentality enables me to focus on what Rose calls, quote, problematizing life and seeking to act upon it. My genealogical exploration of power relations in ideological contexts led me back to Foucault's work on power and its relationship with institutions. The Foucauldian question of how inspired my philosophical framework as it guided my examination of techniques and instruments that are indispensable to the way government agencies operate. My original research project, the intention was to outline the process of my archival feedwork and to summarize the texts and data that I had collected. However, my archival experiences led to a shift from what I collected to how I collected the data in relation to the production of childhood subjectivities in the archives of former Central Europe. I soon realized that I became a hybrid researcher child. My experiences as an archival researcher, the power and politics of the archives, and the complexities of the ethics of research when dealing with sensitive histories of communities where I once used to belong as a child. I myself was hungry for data and for evidence of how childhood was produced, shaped, adjusted, censored, and distributed. I wanted and arrogantly demanded from the archives memoirs, letters, government documents, kindergarten records, and official and underground children's literature, sources ranging from a children's magazines to teacher's notes, from kindergarten chronicles to orders from the government agencies to the educational institutions. To conduct this research, 
I traveled to Czechoslovakia, now the Czech Republic and Slovakia, planning to visit various public and private archival institutions. However, soon I realized how the governance of the context matters. I researched in a country where during the Velvet Revolution, the governing ideology suddenly, in 1999, changed from a totalitarian regime to a Western democracy, driven by a market economy. These complexities relate to the sensitivities of the past and to painful, ambivalent or happy images, depending on who you talk to, that are still fresh in people's minds. I realized the need to complicate the journey of a researcher gathering data as it highlights the power of archival institutions and of the staff who guard the knowledge in it. I refer to the archival administrators and research staff as the guardians of knowledge, as their powerful presence determines what researchers can or cannot do or see in archival institutions. While guardians are appointed by archival institutions to care for and protect the archival documents, they also serve the public and researchers in accessing data. In my research, these guardians were essential in determining what data I could access and how I could access it. In addition, the complexities of my data collection led me to the understanding that archives are not as ethically neutral as they are often portrayed. These are many, there are many ethical concerns to consider as documents found in the archives, if made public, can dramatically change people's lives. During my research, I encountered such an ethical dilemma, and despite not having the time or space to conceptualize it here, there is a Foucauldian problematization of how archival data may not necessarily tell the obvious story or represent the truth researchers look for. Jones and Jenkins writes about muddying history, which they understand in postmodern research as taking a perspective, quote, that do not claim objectivity. The challenge of my archival childhood research was to muddy the archival story about totalitarian childhoods. I did not strive to find an answer as who should be protected in archival research, but to complicate the question of how to be an ethical researcher and how to conduct ethical childhood research in archival institutions in former Eastern Europe. Archival institutions have tremendous power. As Rose argues, institutions such as galleries and museums produce a certain type of knowledge, and in doing so, they create a certain type of visitor. These institutions decide which pictures to make visible and which to keep locked inside the depository. As institutions, they lay out a certain public space, for example, by placing chairs and benches in front of some pictures and not others. They allow visitors to touch some things, while others remain protected. Archival institutions operate on a similar principle, as they use their productive power to issue catalogues and grant researchers access to some materials and not the others. These institutions use their guardians to execute this power over visitors and researchers. Archival institutions need to decide on what they will archive, display, and allow researchers to see and how this will be done. The archives, therefore, cannot be considered to be neutral. Rose reminds us of this and that the process of archiving data involves complex decision-making and politics. The notion of archiving and classification is also Jacques Derrida's concern, as he argues that the way archives operate and store data put certain limitations and categories in place, and therefore, quote, order is no longer assured while the new order takes place. The power and politics of archives has been extensively researched by Jimerson, who also considers these institutions as, quote, sites of power. Similarly, Foucault's work alerts us, through the example of a prison, to how institutions use rules and surveillance to produce those our bodies, subjected and colonized to self-discipline and self-governance, I myself was also produced as a docile archival researcher, using Derrida's argument that there is, quote, no political power without control of the archive. In the sense of post-structural archival research, it was not my intention to discover a report on the truth or historical accuracy of childhoods. I had already developed the complex relationships with truth myself. For example, after the Velvet Revolution in 1989, what we as children believed to be the truth suddenly became redundant. We had memories and experiences of growing up in a totalitarian context, whilst the world around us has changed dramatically with the fall of the Iron Curtain. Almost all that we had practiced, learned, and acquired as knowledge was suddenly proclaimed to be false. I was reminded of these experiences 20 years later during my archival research. Once a citizen of the country, but now treated as a foreigner, New Zealander, I entered these powerful archival institutions. From my first point of contact with the guardians, I was constantly reminded of and confronted with my memories of attitudes towards the people and decisions they made during the totalitarian era. I spoke with many of the guardians about their memories of childhoods, children's literature, and living conditions. And these memories offering, differing from one guardian to another 
and often differing from my own memories and from the stories I had been told. It was not easy to avoid searching for truth, especially if I wanted to stay culturally sensitive and maintain my position as an ethical researcher in the sense of the Havelian concept of living within a truth, to remain respectful to the citizens of the country who feel that they have suffered for a long period of time and who feel partly responsible for the suffering, I had to carefully listen to everyone's story. I often reminded myself of how I was arguing the citizens, including children, who lived within the totalitarian context, were all partly responsible for and partly victims of the regime. The guardians of the archives frequently tried to persuade me of certain historical truths about childhoods, offering me their guidance in doing so. They let me see certain documents and did not let me see others. In some parts of the archives, they didn't allow me to see much, while in others, they allowed me to see everything. From this experience, my research project had to acknowledge not only the data about childhoods I had collected, but also, as Rose guides me, to look for the invisible, to consider what I was not allowed to collect. The truth represented in my research is therefore produced by the archival sources that I was not allowed to access as well. The data I collected can only serve as an illustration of childhoods through examples of a particular era and cannot be generalized or taken out of context. The truth within these archives can only be discovered and negotiated within particular discourses. To further problematize the relationship between archival institutions and researchers, I turn back to Foucault, who argues that subjects do not have one particular singular genealogy, as each subject is produced through multitudes of private and public historical subjectifications. These subjectifications make the quest for truth in archival research complex, if not impossible, to negotiate. Thus, my archival research does not follow any particular historical trait or focus on the accuracy of data produced in certain political and ideological contexts. I cannot ascertain whether children and their childhoods in the archival documents were real or whether the letters they wrote were fake. I considered all the collected data as part of the discourse within which certain childhoods were produced and in which these subjectifications took place. In conducting research, in the totalitarian archives, the truth also becomes an ethical concern on the basis that these children and teachers or their relatives are still alive and the totalitarian era is still very fresh and sometimes painful in people's memories. It's difficult not to polarize public opinion by publishing research concerned with that era. Apart from my own anxiety, the power of the guardians determined what data I collected as well as the way I collected it and they therefore influence the content of my research and produce me as a particular researcher or research subject. While I entered the archives without thinking that I would need to consider the truth and ethics of the data that I may discover, I was forced to reconsider, and my discoveries shaped my archival experience and my research project. They shaped my research and academic subjectivity in this complex form of governmentality of conduct of conduct. The archival institutions produce me as the researcher I am today. Thank you. So, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. I think this will um, raise some question, comments, or something like that. So just give me a hint and you will have the microphone. Hi, thank you. I'm Vince DiGirolamo. I teach at Baruch College, City University of New York. Thank you for these stimulating papers and presentations on governmentality. I couldn't help but remember my first time at the British Museum as a graduate student, uh, getting my photograph taken, getting my card, getting waved in. There was an elderly gentleman uh, who was encountering various uh, hurdles. He was not a scholar, he was not uh, a professional researcher, and he was held up. And he was so frustrated, he held his hands down like this and he said, I am a British subject. Yeah. And I felt ashamed that I was getting in where he couldn't get in. Mm -hmm. And it just reminds me of the power of citizenship, the power of the state, not just as a guardian and a, and a, and a gatekeeper of records, but as a creator of records, as, as that which act, gives people access, as, as, a, as an institution that not just represses and coerces, but at, that, that, that records people's birth and 
entitles them to rights and educations and things like that. So it just seems to me that I heard a lot of interesting things, but the, uh, the opposite of what any of you were, were saying seems also to be true. And so I just, I just want to recognize that, that um, the role of the state, of the government, is, uh, can be as a, um, empowering, not just one in a, in a, in a subject-producing, coercive uh, way. And, and, the, and, and the, the, the subjectivity of citizenship, uh, the, the 14th Amendment, is, is and, and other, and other uh, manifestations, is also quite powerful. So I just wonder, how does that, how does that flip side of the warnings uh, that you're giving us and that Foucault gives us, how is that needs to be integrated into our understanding of governmentality? Um, I, I think that's true. I think great, great um, power is invested in individual citizens of a state. And I think as individuals, we uh, all have to be um, smart and strategic um, about how we use that. What I would say as an islander or as an indigenous person of this country is that the um, availability of citizenship um, is made to certain kinds of political subjects. And the formation of those political subjects, um, and I, I think this is something that came through Pat's paper as well, it, the process of forming those political subjectivities is already taking place in a time of life where full citizenship is not accorded to young children. Um, so I can take the good with the bad. Um, I'm a Torres Strait Islander. I've been a citizen, I guess, since 1967, <laughs> despite having only been born in 1983. Um, I, you know, um, but, you know, citizenship was not available to my father um, at the age of his birth, at the time of his birth. It was not afforded to my grandparents. Um, and so, yes, we seek citizenship, right? That becomes a huge part of civil rights movements around the world. Um, but we take that citizenship with um, care, <laughs> if not cynicism. And when we acquire that citizenship, we are conscious, I think we're all conscious, all of us as subjects of a state, conscious that it creates some kinds of possibilities that are good and affirming and empowering, and it also makes other kinds of things a bit less possible. And in my, um, in my social context, that, that has been performed in quite violent and um, harmful ways. That's, that's really powerful. I, I would, um, the only kind of thing I want to add to it is I think that I'm, I'm not interested, if I came across this way, I've, I, I'm, I'm not interested so much in denouncing citizenship as I am trying to unpack what it's doing to me and others in a institutional, in a, in a sort of general sense. This can be, this is highly personal though. I hold two citizenships. Uh, I'm really grateful uh, that I hold a Canadian passport and that I have three children who are Canadians. And, but in terms of my, sub, I, I open my mouth and everybody knows that I'm an American. Um, and if you have a good ear for it, you probably can tell where. Uh, so, um, but these things are also mobile because in the last few years I've never been so ashamed to be an American. So it's, it's powerful. <laughs> Me? Right. Um, th thanks, everybody. Um, Julia McLeod, University of Melbourne. Um, I had a question that perhaps uh, links a bit to that, and it was the sort of, um, Sana will understand where I'm coming from here, the ambivalences of governmentality, <coughs> the ways in which the um, conceptual totalitarianism of its use these days blunts a fairly nuanced diagnosis of power. And so the way in which it gets converted to an analysis of repressive power rather than counter readings, and I'm thinking about what happens in the archive as well, Yes, 
it is curated and organised in that, but how do we read along that archival grain to elicit other forms of a, a, a accounts of childhood to rescue other stories? So it's, it's really what are the possibilities that that diagnosis opens up, which is partly the opens up, shuts down dynamic. Thanks. <laughs> Yes, that's correct. Give some examples. Great comment. Yeah. Um, hello. I just wanted to ask Sani, when you talked about dangerous, I would really like you to tease that out a little bit more for me because it, it was interesting and exciting because it, it, there's something very um, powerful about it not being defined. So could you just speak a little bit more to... Um. It's, uh, it's a, a framing that I came across in the work of another scholar um, whose interpretation, I guess, of Foucault and governmentality I wouldn't follow the whole way. I find it a useful term, in part picking up on Julie's question, for never... I think there are lots of researchers who, once you start talking about governmentality, do think you're going to produce a very, very um, blunt... Um, critique of power and that the answer to power is freedom and I use the word danger um, and it's hard to use it because I don't want to use it in its pejorative sense um, because danger is something that we tend to recoil from or, or, or feel afraid of but to just try and move to, to position the analysis that is produced through governmentality as one that is not intended to judge. I am not here to say whether citizenship is all good or all bad um, or anything else of that matter. I am not here to offer an indictment on the schooling system for Aboriginal kids. I could, but that's not what governmentality does. Governmentality alerts us to this reifying process between the production of political subjects and the ordering of populations. And the danger in that is that it can produce legitimate forms of violence and harm, um, but the possibilities of that is that it can also produce great um, effective means for producing better futures. Last question up there. Um, hi, Don Romsberg. Um, I loved this, uh, this plenary. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm just thinking about this in, in light of um, yesterday's plenary around adoption. And uh, um, I really like the framework of danger. Uh, in terms of thinking about governmentality in relationship to family structure, um, and I'm for all families structures, right? Um, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if um, you could talk about how precarity might be a good frame alongside danger to think through governmentality in relationship to uh, different kinds of family structures in childhood. I'm also thinking about the family separation thing that you talked about that helps. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really interesting. I don't know if I have a very good answer to your question. I'm kind of rifting between your questions and other questions, but, and I'm drawing off one thing that danger allows, and that, that's an important Foucauldian comment about power and precarity is, I think, a really interesting uh, word. But I would say this, to me, it goes back to reading and I would I, I, I don't want to say that the sort of normative project of denunciation of things that are ethically unsound is unimportant. I would never ever say that. But I would say this, I'm not about doing that. It, I, I think it's okay for me to have a part of my life, it's not my, own, my whole life and it's certainly not my personal life, but when I'm in the archives I'm asking three questions. What does this text argue, what's its logical structure, how is its linguistic arrangement, the grammar and the way it's made, how does that allow that argument to come about, and then what did it actually do historically? Let me give you an example. I've done a lot of work, and part of this book that I'm writing will